Welcome everyone to our monthly webinar series in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. My name is Matt Bauhoff. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. To learn more about the research we do in the center and how you can collaborate, please visit our website. The center does include uh, 24 faculty and principal investigators, as you see here. The research we do in the center of uh, includes a number of subsurface applications uh, that include energy, but also things like carbon capture and storage. We work on a number of different technical disciplines and we use many different engineering tools. We collaborate with industry a lot of different ways. One of them is through our industrial affiliates programs. A few of those are listed below. The newest one, and it is officially launching today, is the last one I have listed here is carbon utilization, storage, and transportation. That's the topic of our webinar today. So uh, these monthly webinar series, again, the, the one today is on carbon utilization, storage, and transportation. Uh, they are informative, industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in CSEE. Generally, they're the first Friday of the month at, at 12 p.m. via Teams. All webinars are uploaded to our YouTube channel. However, we always encourage you to attend live and ask questions in our Q&A. We have a few upcoming webinars. Um, the uh, one next month is by Dr. Kwok Nguyen. And in September, we'll have one by Dr. Ying Lu, which will be titled Wax Crystallization, Gelation, and Deposition. So with that, I would like to introduce today's panelist speakers who will be talking about this new industrial affiliates program on carbon utilization, storage, and transportation. So the first panelist is Dr. Nicolas Espinoza. He's an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering and a member of the center. He is a, a program director of Carbon UT. He received his engineering diploma in civil engineering and holds an MS and PhD in civil engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. His primary interests include mechanics and physics of natural porous solids and granular media, including applications to advanced completion techniques, reservoir geomechanics, geophysics, and formation evaluation. Uh, the main fields that he studies include unconventionals and carbon geological storage and utilization. Our second panelist, Dr. Ryosuke Okunu, is also a program director of Carbon UT and an associate professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. He holds a BE and ME degree in Geosystems Engineering from the University of Tokyo and a PhD in Petroleum Engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Before joining UTPGE, he served as assistant professor Petroleum Engineering at University of Alberta. He has seven years of industrial experience as a reservoir engineer and as a registered professional engineer in Alberta, Canada. His research and teaching interests include enhanced oil recovery, carbon storage and utilization, hydrogen energy, unconventional oil and gas resources, as well as numerical reservoir simulation, thermodynamics, and multi-phase behavior. So with that, I'll turn it over to our panelists who will talk about this uh, exciting new industrial affiliates program. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matt. I'm going to start uh, first with some challenges. And, uh, and again, thank you everyone for attending this uh, webinar. Well, you know, one of the great 21st century challenges is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions drastically. The problem is that uh, human society uh, progress uh, have gone hand by hand uh, with fossil energy consumption and carbon emissions so far. And we have to change these as soon as possible through safe and cost effective technologies. In recent years, uh, we have seen low carbon technologies to grow strongly and we must integrate them with current infrastructure. Here, hydrogen appears as a very promising avenue to help integrating fossil energy with wind, solar, and geothermal. And this is already happening. 
uh, here in Texas, uh, halfway between Austin and Midland. So what are the technical challenges for geological carbon utilization and storage? This can divide in a few categories and we are going to discuss these one by one. First, predicting injectivity can be quite tricky. This is an example from Norway in which uh, injectivity was smaller than expected and so was storage capacity. Typical issues that affect injectivity include permeability heterogeneity, strong compartmentalization, small rock compressibility, and others. And it is not really straightforward to predict injectivity uh, solely from measuring the permeability of the injection interval. This is actually a much complex problem and requires a holistic analysis. Small injectivity can increase bottom hole and reservoir pressure very quickly and approach pressures that cause hydraulic fracturing or full reactivation. So injectivity is really crucial. And having a disposal wellbore with small injectivity is analogous and maybe worse than drilling a dry well. Second, storage capacity is also very important. Early literature uh, used to compute very optimistic storage volumes by assuming we can reach the irreducible water uh, saturation everywhere in target formation. But this is far from reality. And uh, similar to oil and gas recovery factor, we can define a CO2 storage efficiency factor by dividing the volume of, of CO2 by par volume. Unfortunately, these storage efficiency factors in many CO2 projects have been very small so far, considering the net storage pay theoretically available for storage. And these numbers have been as small as 1% or even 1,000th. We must increase these numbers to make carbon geological storage economically viable. Alternatively, we can define a storage efficiency factor based on carbon and molar density and uh, uh, my colleague, Professor Kuhn, is going to talk about that uh, later on. But let's come back to bulk CO2. Why are these storage efficiency factors so low? This is explained by reservoir engineering and geomechanics. Uh, the high mobility and buoyancy of CO2 make the sweep efficiency uh, very low. For example, in this case, we're injecting CO2 into a reservoir Right after we stop injection, we see how the CO2 starts rising up uh, with time. Here's a stop by a cap rock and by a fault uh, on, on the right. But that buoyancy is, is a big issue and it's going to be always there. And we need to make sure that we know how to deal with that and how to trap it in order to assure permanent uh, CO2 storage. Increasing pressure in the reservoir as done in any process of injection also presents risks. Uh, for example, uh, in this case, in the Decatur project in Illinois, uh, there has been measure, measurements of induced uh, micro and also micro seismicity up to a magnitude two. And here you, we see the, the epicenters of that uh, seismicity along sub seismic resolution uh, faults. Um, so this is something that we really need to take care of. And here, geomechanics is very important to, to get safe solutions for CO2 storage and utilization. Among the solutions that we have uh, are also uh, storing in depleting, depleted reservoirs, adding a producer or using existing wells, and also uh, storing uh, CO2 in formations that may not be prone to induce seismicity. And a new one, uh, would be to uh, store carbon in other chemical forms. And, and Professor Okun is going to talk about that uh, later on. Third, monitoring plays a key role in making sure CO2 goes where we want. Today, we account with seismic, micro seismic, and electrical resistivity monitoring, among others. These technologies are great, but uh, it might be impractical to do all of these for every single storage site. Instead, instrumented injector wells present great opportunities for cost-effective and real-time monitoring. 
We have seen great advances in the hydraulic fracturing community using case hole pressure monitoring and fiber optics that could be extended to monitor carbon storage. For example, recently we have conducted studies that show that pore pressure can be altered hundreds of meters away above the cap rock in the absence of any leaks. Uh, here is a generic example. Let me play the video where we inject CO2 into the reservoir formation right here. Pressure increases are very large in this reservoir formation, but also we see tiny yet measurable changes above the cap rock and also under the cap rock, but for interest to us is if we were to instrument an injector that we could measure these changes of pressure to tell uh, what is going to be the movement of CO2 and also to help see if uh, there might be a leak in this case uh, or not. Surface monitoring is also part of a comprehensive carbon storage system. The worst case scenario is a surface leak through a fault or abandoned wellbore. Uh, but also surface facilities can leak, particularly when they have to be operated at supercritical CO2 conditions. Carbon dioxide can also benefit from recent advances in monitoring methane, uh, monitoring of methane emissions. And we're happy to announce that our research center has hired a full-time research professor working on monitoring of fugitive uh, gas emission that we look forward to collaborate with in our new industri industrial affiliate program. Maybe one of the biggest concerns in carbon geological storage is seal integrity. And I'd like to cite uh, here uh, Professor Carter from Oxford, who says, all seals leak. The question is when and where. And this is partly due to the complexity of sedimentary systems, which we cannot fully map in three dimensions and across many time scales. And uh, we cannot ascertain that there will be a tiny fracture now or in the future that could be a high permeability path. So uh, we all love Mother Earth, but uh, we can't fully trust her on this. A low risk solution for CO2 storage requires redundancy, several layers of protection, and must be ready with remediation methods to account for the unexpected. Ceiling integrity includes uh, the cap rock, uh, ceiling faults, and well bores, uh, new ones and old ones. Uh, for example, our center director, Professor Balko, has developed methods to plug leaking well bores with microgels that are sensitive to the presence of CO2. And I have also worked in testing ductile geopolymer cements to improve sonal isolation in shales. Last, we need to make carbon capture, utilization, storage, and transportation economically viable. An engineer professor once told me in class, an engineer who doesn't know how to handle money is not an engineer, but a physicist. So we not only must develop great science and novel solutions, uh, but also make sure they are economically viable. Recent carbon credits in many countries Many countries are helping CCUS take off, and this is of great help to make cash flows positive. In fact, uh, injecting CO2 exhibits a, a sort of a, of a decline curve similar to what we have in the production of an oil and gas reservoir. Of course, it depends in a few additional factors. Inject as fast and as much as possible with safe limits. Um, as an example, uh, we have put together reservoir simulation, geomechanics, cash flows, and machine learning to help optimize CO2 injection location and injection schedules. We need machine learning in this case to find local maxima of net present value because it's practically impossible to run couple simulation for all possible injector locations and uh, schedules. On top of this, carbon utilization can help uh, with secondary and tertiary uh, recovery. A new opportunity is to use uh, source rocks as uh, CO2 sinks. And also there could be value in produced brine. Uh, you, you may wonder how. For example, we could 
but charge it with CO2 or other carbon species derived from CO2 before re-injecting it into the subsurface. Uh, well, I hope this introduction triggers uh, many questions. I will pass the control to Professor Kuno now and look forward to the discussion uh, later on. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, so I'm uh, Ryosuke Okuno. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a um, new idea that we would like to test as part of the consortium. And I also hope that uh, this gives an example of um, what we do differently from uh, other consortia in this area. So in the traditional way of carbon storage, the capsule CO2 at the emission point is transported uh, through pipeline and directly injected into the target formation by gas compressor. So the idea to be tested uh, here is that the carbon transport and the geological storage can be done in a more efficient and reliable way by converting the capsule CO2 into formate and formic acid and then make an aqueous solution of it for injection. So basically what is proposed here is that using formate is an excellent way to make carbon bearing water so that we can uh, inject the uh, carbon as part of the water phase. So this reaction of the conversion of CO2 into formate can be done in an electrochemical way. And to my knowledge, this electrochemical reaction is uh, rated as technology uh, readiness level of four as of now. So it's ready for uh, the pilot testing. So today we don't have enough time to discuss all aspects of uh, format injection, but uh, potential benefits of format injection include the EOR, uh, carbon storage, enhanced carbon storage in comparison to CO2, and hydrogen production by decomposing the injected formic acid into hydrogen CO2. Again, the idea of using a format presented here is currently hypothetical, and um, it's presented here to only uh, illustrate our thinking outside of the box. So in the traditional way of CO2 injection given above, is a still excellent way to perform uh, um, CO2 EOR and uh, CCUS. So uh, our the proposal of uh, using um, formate as a carbon storage uh, came from um, the fundamental consideration of oil and CO2 as carbon bearing species. So as you know, oil contains many carbons. For example, if average molecule weight of reservoir oil is five, the combustion of one mole of the oil results in emission of five moles of CO2. So it seems to be a difficult task to make a neutral carbon balance in oil production and the CO2 storage. So here I'm comparing carbon molar density for the two species. So you see the carbon density of pentane or C5 is much greater than that of CO2 at the given temperature pressure at the 75 degrees uh, Celsius and 10 megapascal, for example. The carbon density of C5 is eight times greater than that of CO2. So this indicates that it's important for us to store carbon in a large quantity in a countable, reliable, and efficient way. Then we thought that uh, storing carbon doesn't have to be done as CO2. So CO2 emission is a difficult problem because it's essentially uh, the discharge of carbon from the subsurface to the atmosphere as a gas. This carbon discharge is of course invisible, unlike oil spill, so it's not easy to identify and recognize. The carbon emission as CO2 results in rapid uh, dispersion in the atmosphere, which results in undesirable greenhouse effect. As the concentration of CO2 increases in the atmosphere, the increase in CO2 pressure pressure results in water acidification in the surf uh, in surface aqueous systems. And many difficulties in storing CO2 also comes from phase behavior and the physical properties of CO2. So as Nicholas mentioned, the buoyancy-driven flux after injection 
cause is the inefficient use of power volume in the formation. In the swept region, the immiscibility of CO2 with water results in incomplete displacement even at the microscopic scale. So it's, it makes sense to also consider CO2 storage in deep saline aquifer because CO2 density becomes greater under high pressure. But CO2 storage in deep saline aquifer has its own issues. For example, it most likely requires drilling new wells. Now, uh, many researchers are studying CO2 utilization for carbon circular economy by uh, CO2 conversion into various species. So EOR slash CCUS is categorized as a non-conversion in this diagram without converting CO2 into any other species. In this discussion, the central uh, idea to be tested is that the geological carbon storage can be done in a more efficient and reliable way by converting the capsule CO2 into formate species and injecting aqueous solution of it into geological formation so that the water can carry carbon. So, uh, so we, we are particularly interested in formate or formic acid because it's highly soluble in brines enabling to uh, make carbon bearing water. So we recently um, found that the solubility of formate species is around 30 to 35 weight percent in brines, and it's uh, quite insensitive to the brine salinity, divalent ion concentrations, and temperature. So here, is a list of potential benefits of formate injection. So I haven't mentioned the EOR, EOR aspect of it, but uh, basically uh, formate can act as a wettability modifier that can enhance oil recovery from rock matrix by uh, water imbibition. So if you're interested in that type of technology, please watch the June webinar that I presented. So our recent results show that the 5 weight percent formate in brine produced twice more oil than low salinity water from carbonate rock matrix. That was based upon 5 weight percent formate brine, but uh, increasing formate concentration in brine will be beneficial both for EOR and the carbon storage purposes. And using formate solution injection, it's possible to make a water flooding a low carbon balance process. The second point in this list, uh, carbon storage, is the main focus of this talk. The formate the injection is expected to be efficient um, and uh, robust uh, carbon storage in comparison to CO2 for several reasons. At the most uh, reservoir conditions, the formate result in denser carbon storage than CO2. And we can adjust the injection water density to control uh, buoyancy in the formation in order to improve the volumetric sweep of this carbon bearing water. Also, the injection formate solution is a miscible displacement of formation water by this carbon bearing water phase, unlike CO2 injection. And also, using the formate as carbon carrier, there is no need for CO2 pipeline transportation, gas compressors, and the gas processing facilities. And last point about hydrogen. Uh, although we don't have time to discuss this today, but uh, if we injected the formate, uh, formic acid solution is produced, it can be decomposed into hydrogen and CO2 at uh, moderate temperature with a catalyst. So injecting uh, formate, formic acid into formation can be viewed as essentially making a hydrogen reservoir. And uh, from this point on, I'm going to focus upon the second uh, uh, item in the list, carbon storage aspect of formate injection. So for specific discussion, I'm giving a simple example to show how much carbon storage can be expected by formate. So in terms of bulk storage, without considering the fluid flow in porous media, the formation solution, sorry, formate solution is 200 times denser carbon storage in comparison to CO2 at the standard conditions. 
and concerning the solubility of formate in brine. One barrel of brine can contain 70 kilogram of CO2. Also, the formate solution is going to be in direct contact with water with the surfaces, and it results in surface absorption of formate, which is 0.1 milligram per gram of rock based upon our measurement using sandstone and carbonates. With the solubility and the absorption data for formate, here's the example calculation of uh, surf subsurface storage. So if we assume uh, this size of formation with a porosity of 25%, a sweep efficiency of 17% gives an aqueous phase storage of uh, 550,000 metric tons CO2 equivalent and the surface absorption of 130 metric tons CO2 equivalent. And another way to look at the potential of formate uh, solution is shown here. In the lower 48 states, the product produced water amounts to at least uh, 40 billion barrel per year, according to this uh, 2004 paper. If the produced water is re-injected as formate solution, it can contain a lot of carbon equivalent to uh, 2.8 gigaton of um, CO2 per year. It is reported that the CO2 emission is 30 gigaton per year. So using formate solution for re-injection of the produce of water, 9% of the total carbon emission in the world can be brought to the subsurface. So in the previous uh, two slides, we discussed uh, like bulk storage without considering subsurface flow. In this slide, I'm showing uh, simulation cases of carbon storage in the aquifer. So one case is for formate solution injection and the other for uh, CO2 injection. But, so this is very simple 2D uh, model with the heterogeneous distribution of shady faces. Just to illustrate the rapid breakthrough of CO2 and the enhanced carbon storage by formate solution. The shady faces is, is shown in blue and the clean sand is in red in this figure and the injector is on the uh, left side and the producer is located on the right side to maintain the formation pressure. The formation the formate solution has a very similar density to the formation brine around the uh, 1200 kilogram per cubic meter However, the CO2 density is only 73 kg per cubic meter at the injection temperature pressure conditions in this simulation. So the injected CO2 is subject to uh, substantial buoyancy, uh, buoyant forces after the injection. So over concentration of CO2 in these simulations are shown here. So the, currently these are showing a uh, uh, few months, uh, one month after injection. And uh, after that, uh, you see CO2 rapidly uh, go up and near the ceiling of the formation and then break through, while formate takes a uh, much longer time before breakthrough of formate. And you see th there are different flow regimes between the two cases. And CO2 case result in rapid breakthrough because of the density difference between the immiscible phases, CO2 and the water. And also uh, multi-phase flow resulting in incomplete displacement even at the microscopic scale in the CO2 case. And these problems can be improved by formate injection. Also, I, as I briefly mentioned, if we injected formate species are produced we can decompose it into hydrogen and CO2 at the moderate temperature with a catalyst. So saturated form, formate saturated formation can be viewed as a hydrogen reservoir. So this figure shows the produced water in terms of percent of original water in place. This basically represents the full volume displaced by the injectant. So breakthrough of CO2 occurs around the, at the three months when 23% of initial water is displaced by CO2. 
After that, displacement efficiency levels off, and the breakthrough format occurs around 10 months when 51% of initial water is displaced by the injected uh, format solution. The figure on the right compares the two cases in terms of cumulative carbon mole numbers stored in the formation. The amount of stored carbon at the breakthrough time is about seven times greater for the format case in comparison to uh, the CO2 case. After the breakthrough, the CO2 case doesn't increase the carbon storage much, but the format case showed a steady increase in carbon storage even after breakthrough in this case. The difference is expected to change for different reservoir properties and operating conditions, but this simple 2D simulation case shows that the potential of format injection to substantially enhance the carbon storage in comparison to the conventional CO2 injection. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, this is uh, only one of the research topics that we'd like to do as part of the consortium. And I presented this to illustrate a new idea to be tested as an example. And again, uh, this is not to uh, uh, exclude uh, CO2 injection as is. It's still an excellent way to do a miscible EOR slash CCUS. So. And then going back to more general description of the consortium, uh, Carbon UT's uh, overall goal is to perform fundamental research for reducing carbon emissions through geological carbon storage and utilization. So we hope that the Carbon UT will help accelerate the knowledge transfer for the worldwide deployment of carbon storage utilization and transport uh, transportation. The carbon management during this uh, energy transition time requires an interdisciplinary approach, so we have a wide range of expertise as PIs. So carbon UTs covers all aspects required for geological carbon storage in the energy transition time, so uh, such as uh, formation evaluation, reservoir engineering, transportation, risk mitigation and control, and unconventional geothermal and hydrogen. Here's a contact information for uh, Carbon UT. We have made a web page for this new consortium. Uh, if you are interested in participating in the consortium, please do not hesitate to contact any of us. And uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Okay, that was a uh, terrific, uh, Nicholas and Ryosuke. Uh, uh, again, my name is Matt Bauhoff. I'm going to moderate the questions. So we have uh, another 25 minutes or so to to ask questions. Please do submit your questions in the chat. Um, I see that there's already several questions, so uh, please do that. I have a few questions myself as well, so I will combine the, the questions together. Uh, I'm going to start out with some logistical questions, and uh, this will be for both Nicol for both Nicholas and Ryosuke. Uh, the first is about the IAP, the Industrial Affiliate Program. So this is a brand new program. Uh, today is the official launch date, so very exciting for us in the center. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more um, how industry sponsors can join the IAP? Maybe, uh, Nicholas, we'll start with you. Uh, sure, Matt. Um, so uh, here you have the contact information. I would strongly recommend that you contact either myself or, or Yusuke or also Tracy, and uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll discuss uh, what has to be done. But basically, uh, we're going to operate similar to other industrial affiliate programs. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a flat uh, annual rate for those uh, companies that may, may want to join and uh, and the fees are going to be like the typical fees that that you uh, that you have in in this type of consortium so so not not too many changes to what you are really uh, used to i don't know if Rosuke, you want to complement anything Yes, uh, so uh, we'd love to uh, hear um, the 
the research interest and technical uh, questions from the industry and would like to implement them as much as uh, possible. So, so if we are interested in, uh, please, please uh, contact any of us and uh, uh, have a discussion, um, one, one on one discussion. So that would be great. OK, great. Thank you. So uh, I have a follow up question, which is, is that um, in addition to our center and your new industrial affiliates program, I know that there are a lot of other groups at the University of Texas that work on carbon capture and storage, uh, particularly in the Bureau of Economic Geology and, and the Department of Chemical Engineering. Can you tell me a little bit more about how your IEP uh, is a little different from from what uh, their groups do and, and how you will collaborate with them? All right. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, so th this is a great question. And uh, it, at the University of Texas already, we have uh, a, two industrial fluid programs, uh, one uh, chemical engineering focusing on, on capturing and another one at BEG on the, for the Gulf Coast uh, Carbon Center. And those are fantastic uh, GIPs, fantastic industry affiliate programs. Uh, I have worked, for example, together with uh, with people from the Gulf Coast uh, Carbon Center. And for those of you that may not know, about uh, 10 to 5 years ago, uh, there were three industrial affiliate programs, including one at the uh, at UT uh, Petroleum Engineering Department, which was called the CO2 Geologic, uh, Geological Storage Consortium. And at that time, uh, those three consortia had a, a meeting the same week and in the same place. So the University of Texas at Austin uh, was becoming a, a week uh, in the year the center, uh, I'm tempted to say the, cent the center of the world, but that, that may be too much. But uh, it was becoming a hub here in the US for all technology uh, related uh, to carbon ge uh, geological storage and utilization. Uh, so we are uh, complementary. We can work together. We have worked together before. And uh, probably I'll, I'll leave this to Rosuke on the, to talk a little bit more about uh, what we do uh, different from the, point of, from the point of view of engineering and controlling flow. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that that's the main message that, for example, for those in industry affiliates that are already part of uh, of some other programs, a, a UT Austin could be a, a one stop a solution for almost all of your uh, uh, issues or challenges in carbon utilization, storage and, and transportation. Uh, Ryosuke, do you want to, to add something? No, you really uh, addressed the question very well. So, uh, but I think the the main difference comes from you know different background uh, um, the expertise, and the, our expertise really is coming from engineering uh, side of uh, petroleum engineering, and a uh, um, lot of application by itself, but also as uh, I presented as an example, um, there's a lot of new ideas that we can test by combining uh, um, subsurface engineering and um, um, some other disciplines like the chemistry. So, so, but I think the main difference really comes from our background that is different from uh, other um, other groups in this area at UT. So. All right, great. Well, th thanks for the responses. Um, I do have some technical questions. Um, some of these are my own, but some of these come from the chat. We've got Lots of uh, great questions in the chat. So uh, the first one's going to be for uh, Dr. Okunu. Um, and the question is, is that are there any subsurface conditions where the formate reaction could reverse itself? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, um, so geochemistry of uh, formate uh, in the presence of uh, the rock and uh, uh, other uh, the salt of species is a uh, is one of the main things we would like to uh, study first as part of this consortium. And uh, some people have been doing this research, uh, the geochemistry 
involving formate in the context in the context of uh, abiotic uh, hydrocarbon. Right? As you might know, it, the this uh, upper mantle, like a deep earth, um, the, the fluid system can have a the formate as a natural uh, uh, reaction intermediate between CO2 and hydrocarbon. So, so there are some uh, existing uh, research and uh, we are going to based upon those uh, literature, but we would like to, um, you know, study more in the context of CCUS. And then uh, I think uh, yeah, as, as you mentioned, uh, understanding the geochemistry is a key to, to understand how our format is going to, um, you know, potentially change its form, so. Hey, great, thanks. Uh, I have a, a question for Dr. Espinoza. Uh, as you know, uh, unconventional shales uh, present an enormous volume um, throughout the world, but especially in the United States. What is the potential storage of CO2 in, in these shale reservoirs? I think there is a great potential for uh, CO2 storage in, in shales uh, because both clays and organic matter develop a preferential affinity to attract CO2 molecules over other uh, or uh, other uh, uh, like hydrocarbons. And, and this is a process which is commonly referred as absorption. And uh, organic matter among those two has the, the largest absorption capacity. And, uh, and this, this means actually that depleted shales uh, could be converted to CO2 sinks. And probably the, uh, the easiest formation to, to work with uh, would be actually a, a shale gas, particularly if they are naturally fractured because the injectivity is going to be uh, higher than those. At some point I, I mentioned that, uh, that we need a redundant seals and, and we need to plan for, for the unexpected. And in the case of, uh, of source rocks, given the higher affinity of source rocks for CO2 opposed, for example, to methane, uh, we are sure that in those cases, uh, these source rocks are going to maintain the, the, the CO2 for a, an indef indefinite amount of time, uh, beating the forces of, of buoyancy too. Uh, so I think that there is a great potential, but there's still many things to to figure out. Fortunately, also in our department, uh, we have a great expertise related to hydraulic fracturing and reservoir geomechanics that can help with that. Uh, but there are still uh, details to figure out uh, with different kind of shales, either if they are in the oil or gas window or if um, or or um, the, the concentrations of, of organic matter of, uh, of minerals and this is something that, that we want to figure out in this new industrial affiliate program. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Kunu. Uh, how easy is it to convert CO2 to formate? Would continuous injection of an acid solution, in other words, formate not be problematic to surface facilities, the wellbore, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, this, uh, this reaction uh, process, um, it, so there's no uh, commercial scale um, demonstration of this uh, electrochemical reaction um, process to my knowledge. And uh, as I said, uh, right now it's rated as uh, te technology readiness level four. And I think uh, it's uh, really uh, timing for a uh, small scale pilot and uh, we are in contact with uh, some companies uh, that are uh, making this reaction system. And um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, easiness of handling a formate solution for surface um, facilities and also uh, a well bore, I think uh, um, I think to me it's a uh, I think it's a, a quite a sort of war to handle. Uh, for example, um, pH can be adjusted uh, by um, formate and formic acid mixture, and uh, uh, density can be adjusted, and uh, and uh, the 
fortunately, the solubility of formate it seems to be uh, quite insensitive to uh, uh, salinity, temperature, and divergent ions. So, so that means it's easy to adjust the density also. And uh, the formate can contain a lot of carbon uh, at the low pressure, unlike gas CO2. So that makes uh, like a, making everything much easier than handling CO2. So, uh, but uh, I think all these should come with uh, e economic analysis. So we'd like to also study that aspect as part of the consortium. So it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okuno. Uh, Dr. Espinoza, uh, one potential storage uh, is uh, depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs. Uh, do you view these as being safe for CO2 storage? Um, depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs, I think that they are extremely attractive for uh, carbon utilization and storage. Um, uh, because, for example, they already have the existing infrastructure. infrastructure. Um, we, they are in regions that we know them more or less uh, well. Uh, for example, uh, regarding the, the seal integrity, from the point of view of just fluid flow and capillary sealing, a, a cap rock is about 40% more sealing to CO2 than to methane. And that's because of a combination of surface tension and buoyancy. Uh, even though the, the, the interfacial tension between CO2 and water is lower for CO2 than for methane, and methane has a lower density, therefore the, uh, has a, a higher buoyancy pressure. So for the same column, we can say that uh, cap rocks are 40% uh, more sealing to, to CO2 than for methane. From the point of view of geomechanics, it's a uh, the story is a little bit more complex um, because uh, both depletion and injection result in changes of stresses in the reservoir, in the cap rock, and also uh, below the reservoir. And, uh, and for example, uh, if, if we have a, an initial pressure uh, in a depleted reservoir, which is lower than before depletion, then uh, injection would be easier and storage capacity would be larger than if we had the original uh, pore pressure. There are even some, some models that predict that injecting into a depleted uh, formation that has gone under a loading path upon unloading uh, could uh, show the stress going uh, not as close to for reactivation as it will go uh, if you started at the pressure, at the original pressure uh, without a depletion. So that's on the good side. On, on, the, on the not that positive side, we can say that, especially for, for all the reservoirs, there might be abandoned wellbores that uh, are not in good shape or were not uh, well cemented. And that's where our engineering uh, comes into place, where we want to develop. And for example, we could think about patching some of these reservoirs before doing injection, or if needed, to remediate uh, these uh, these leaks in case there is any flow uh, through through these wellbores. But overall, I, I think we 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 need to take advantage of those. We need to start uh, with those, and I think that they are going to be economical for uh, CO2 storage in the future. And of course, for utilization too. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Okuno, here's a, a question for you. Um, are there any concerns about formic acid uh, and carbonate formations? For example, any dissolution that might occur? Yeah, it's a really good question. Again, I think uh, geochemistry uh, should be uh, very well studied for that uh, purpose, like uh, especially calcite dissolution. And uh, I think highly depends on uh, pH and the uh, temperature. And uh, the, at the injection time, uh, pH is uh, fully adjustable. Um, a formate is a like weak weak base, uh, and formic acid is a weak uh, 
acid, and then we we can actually adjust the pH to be uh, like uh, seven or a little bit more than seven. And uh, uh, as long as the pH is uh, under control, I I believe we can uh, avoid uh, the uh, react the uh, undesirable reactions that causes the gaseous CO two. But I think again uh, we have to com you know consider all aspects of uh, uh, geochemistry, including uh, um, uh, different minerals, uh, brine, uh, temperature, and again, uh, we'd like to study it uh, as uh, one of the major uh, questions in the initial stage of this research. So uh, it's, again, it's a really good question. Thank you so much. Great. So I have a question uh, really for both of you. This is uh, about the industrial affiliates program. Are there any industry partners already members of Carbon UT, and what are their commitments required? Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. So, uh, as you said in in the beginning, we we're starting we're starting now. We we put together this industrial affiliate program very recently. Uh, we are already talking to to industrial uh, partners, uh, uh, some of, of them more advanced uh, than others. And, uh, and we are uh, getting the documents ready to to be signed now in uh, in July. So uh, as soon as we get uh, those documents ready, uh, we'll start having uh, officially uh, some of the industrial partners to to join the the consortium. And and there was another question, Matt. Uh, I might have forgotten. Well, uh, it was uh, what are the commitments um, as part of the IAP? Oh, okay. Um, well, our, our commitments uh, from from us, and probably I can pass this to to Rusuke, who has a um, a backup slide. Is that correct, Rusuke? Okay. So yeah. So the uh, so on, on on your right, uh, you see uh, the members' benefits um, from this uh, consortium, and uh, yeah. So early access to Nobel research findings. Uh, through the web page and annual meeting and online support through uh, project specific follow up access to research database result in house software and algorithm several routines and a collaboration for analysis of field data lab testing and field samples and uh, and so on so so i think um, we are still flexible because we just started and then uh, try to attract uh, uh, the members from this point on. So even this benefit, I think we, we can um, adjust uh, to some extent depending on the uh, maybe first uh, set of members. I'm sorry, Dr. Akuno, I was just going to follow up. Uh, there have been several companies that have already indicated that they plan to join. Is that right? Yes, so yeah, um, we, we we have already uh, sent uh, um, the agreement uh, uh, document to, to for for their internal processes. So so we are really mo uh, moving forward very well. OK, um, I have a question for Dr. Espinoza. Uh, this is a more of a technical question, but how can injectivity be improved for CCUS? Uh, OK, uh, so as I was mentioning before, sometimes uh, uh, predicting injectivity uh, can can be can be really tricky, and and this is going to depend mostly if we're thinking on storage only, or on uh, utilization. So uh, for storage only, um, the main limitation is that there are some places that may have a high initial pore pressure, and uh, Injecting is going to cause a pressure buildup that could cause either the wellbore fracturing or or fall reactivation, something that which is which is undesirable. Um, so in order to avoid this, uh, we not only have to do uh, or or to to employ advanced formation evaluation methods to do a region a regional characterization, but also well testing is necessary. Uh, well testing is is needed before injection. In order to see if actually uh, some of these formations can take uh, as much CO2 as uh, as we need it or as we as we plan, and for utilization, the solution is a little bit easier. Uh, 
and uh, if we have either existing well bores or producers nearby, uh, we can control what is the pore pressure uh, in the formation. In some of these cases, we may even use uh, hydraulic fracturing to our advantage in order to, to bypass the damage zone near the, the injection well bore, or if we have a precipitation of salt as a result of, of brine drying by CO2, um, and increase the, the surface area and therefore the, the injection rates. I have a, a question for you, Dr. Okunu. Um, so this question is about transportation. How is the formate transported to the injection site? Okay, yeah, so it's a, it's basically brine um, that contain carbon uh, as a formate. And uh, so there's no need for gas compressor, uh, no need for uh, CO2, uh, CO2, uh, you know, resistant uh, uh, steel pipe. Um, and then also, also, as I mentioned before, pressure doesn't have to be high to increase density of carbon. And uh, I think one benefit is that uh, now uh, it's possible to transport carbon to offshore by uh, by, by water phase, unlike uh, CO two transportation. So um, I, I think uh, it's a it's a very um, promising uh, uh, aspect of form a solution. Um, that uh, we can uh, make uh, surface processes much uh, uh, cheaper and easier to handle carbon. So, um, but I think uh, we would, you know, like to study this in the context of some particular uh, field conditions. So, if uh, member companies can provide uh, some cases to be studied as part of this consortium, that would be great. Dr. Espinosa, my next question is about monitoring. Uh, what do you see as the current challenges and, and problems and limitations with current monitoring techniques? Uh, okay, so for example, uh, for the seismic is, is, is really good, but it takes a lot of time to do in the field. Then you have to, to invert your, your solution. And uh, also that's an in, in additional, uh, additional step it, it's kind of expensive and also it's 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 limited in the in the resolution of saturation that you can capture small saturations under 20 uh, percent or so are, are, are very difficult to to detect with seismic tool uh, micro seismic is fantastic but uh, it doesn't really tell us where the actual co2 is going uh, so, in, in that sense, it's, it's mostly uh, complementary. Uh, we also, uh, something I didn't mention in the presentation was observation wells. Um, but we cannot put observation wells everywhere. And observation wells are mostly limit, limited to scientific projects. Uh, so, uh, I, I think those are the main challenges. And uh, something that th most of those methods uh, lack is to be cost effective and to be uh, to work in real time and uh, and that's something that, that could be done and i think should be done in the future and could be done uh, for any uh, injector uh, in order to to control co2 to see if, if there are potential leaks or not or or just to see if the, the injection is going as uh, planned so um I, I think you know there has to be a little bit of development in this area, but but it's something that that can be done and and should be done in the in the future in order to refine uh, these technologies for CCUS. We're, we're we're a little short on time, so I think I'm going to ask two more questions. Uh, th this first one's going to be for Dr. Okuno, which is. Uh, what is the additional cost of conversion to formate above the normal cost of CO2 capture? at a coal-fired power plant, for example? Yeah, so right now it's uh, not an uh, easy question to answer, um, to be honest, because um, this reaction system, um, there's no uh, commercial scale uh, as of now. And um, so, but... Uh,
so in terms of uh, energy requirement for the conversion, uh, we have some data here. So I'm sharing the slide. Uh, the operational cost for electrochemical conversion of CO2. Uh, of course, it depends on the process used, but the uh, preliminary estimation for the conversion is given as follows. So in terms of energy requirement, it's a 3.2 kilowatt hour per kilogram potassium formate. And, and if we convert this um, to 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 dollar, it's uh, basically uh, 16 cents per pound of formic acid, and uh, um, so of course this is op operational cost only, and uh, capital expenditure. I think it uh, highly depends on um, the upscaling scenario based upon the current technology and. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, I don't have a clear uh, number to to be shown here. So I have some estimation, but uh, I'm hesitant showing it uh, at the moment. So I think that's a that's a um, the answer I can give at the moment. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dr. Akunu. I'm going to ask the final question, and and you can both answer this, but maybe we'll start with Dr. Espinoza. Um, as a petroleum engineer, I've always been fascinated with the idea of carbon storage and utilization. Um, I, I, I see utilization as being the world's greatest recycling system, where we inject CO2 to produce more hydrocarbons, which are used to create more CO2. Can, can you uh, comment a little bit more about uh, the potential of utilization and some of the things that you'll be doing in the IAP in that regard? OK, so I'm, I'm going to start. Uh, we we know that, that CO2 has been utilized for CO2 UR for, for several decades so far uh, with, the, with, with a high degree of, of success in, in many places. And, and the story could, uh, could continue, for example, uh, with, with shales. Now we, we know that that methane can uh, can increase the, the production of, of oil in in all shales, and uh, and CO2 could also help in that regard, and also with the simultaneous uh, uh, capturing in the subsurface of uh, of carbon dioxide. And I think we, we really need to to close or to um, to to make this carbon cycle uh, a loop. So, so we really stop uh, emitting uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and uh, at the same time, we need to provide energy to to all the to, to all the world, and and that that's a that's a big challenge, and I think uh, utilization is going to be a, a big part of the solution in the following decades. Yeah, so I, I think uh, I, I'm very excited about uh, this um, this this change around the CO2 UR, um, where we need to now consider life cycle, um, basically carbon balance, and uh, that uh, change the way we implement the CO2 EOR. And um, also, uh, I think uh, carbon utilization, uh, so C CO2 utilization. Now I think uh, I'm more um, more of a like a carbon utilization instead of CO2 utilization. So, so if we look at the carbon as part of CO2, I think there are so many other way of you know doing the storage, and the potentially EOR as I mentioned, formate is uh, um, going to change the rock wettability just like a low salinity water with a uh, with a with, with a with a sulfate ions. So. There are so many ways to think about uh, many different uh, new ideas. So, so I, I, I think it's a really exciting opportunity for us to um, think outside the box. Um, but again, I think uh, miscible CO2 UR is a really, um, you know, uh, traditional but still imp very important uh, technology. OK, uh, thanks a lot. Um, and, and I'd like to conclude by thanking both of our speakers. So Dr. Akuno and Dr. Espinoza, uh, really excited about this new industrial affiliates program. Uh, so for all of our attendees, um, if you're interested 
please do contact us. We can send you uh, more information about it, how to join, and uh, a little bit more about the, the member benefits. So um, thank you all again.